Okay, so yeah, I mean, not for those who don't know me or just don't know me, uh, I am interested in the relation between sensory perception and action in insects. Um, and I will start with the actions or behavior. I chose these slides because a lot of you already know it, and this is from a seminal paper by Gordon Berman trying to characterize behavior. And he was saying that we could think about behavior as, um, as a trajectory that moves through a high dimensional space of postural dynamics. In this space, uh, behaviors are basically epochs of temporarily extended bouts of some sort of stereotypic action. And if you look at different types of behavior, they often consist of very highly stereotypic, often rhythmic activity. So from flying to chewing to walking to grooming or molting or breathing, we have some sort of rhythmic activation of antagonistic muscles that are doing their job right, left, um, up, down, um, contracts, um, etc. And one of the questions that interested me when I started working on motor control for my postdoc in Princeton was to what extent these are pre-programmed, to what extent these are already programmed how to be achieved before the behavior is actually being executed. Um, if we think about, sorry, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, so this was a question I was very interested in. And then I joined a group uh, of engineers trying to understand how cockroaches, this, which is one of the fastest animals on Earth, run. Um, so cockroaches run very fast. They pass 50 times their body length in a second, which is comparable for a human being to run in 330 kilometers per hour. And they do this incredible stuff. Here in this video, we see the cockroach raise itself from horizontal movement to vertical movement within 75 milliseconds. It actually uses his head as some sort of bumper yeah. to uh, convert the force of collision to raise its, uh, its body upward vertically. So when we try to understand how behavior is generated, we have to take into account the nervous system, the controller that actually activates the muscle to generate the behavior. We have to take into account the body, the mechanical system, the muscles, the, um, the, muscles, the bones, the structures. And in the example we saw before, we saw how the head is used as a bumper. Uh, we also think for fast running, we always, we always need stiff legs to absorb to overcome the damping in the joints or for grasping our fingers are kind of humid and soft so we have a better grasping so the mechanical structures are also important and also of course the environment in which the body interacts with. I will mainly focus on this talk on the controller on the nervous system and if we think about the nervous system we try to think how a nervous system controls locomotion uh, <clears throat> we can we can start by reducing it to two main axes. So we, have, we want to design some sort of nervous system that moves some sort of body. Uh, we can think about how distributed versus centralized that nervous system will be, whether we have a centralized control of the entire body or whether each joint, each limb will be activated separately. And the other axis that is very important when we design the controller is how much feed forward, how much pre-programmed, how much we can have the computer already run the program versus feedback, reactive system, how much information we need from knowing that my hand is actually touched here to know that now it's time to lift it up. And the way the design, or at least theoretical consideration, would say that the design system or exact location on this two-dimensional map will depend on the speed of the movement and the properties environment of the environment. So the more complex the environment is, the environment the animal moves in, the higher we need for feedback control in that environment. So I just put it here, two examples that are very um, kind of extreme, two extreme examples. So we have the stick insect walking on leaves and all these branches in all orientation towards gravity. It actually really needs to know where, it each, where its each uh, foot is located to know whether it can lift another foot or not. Uh, so when the environment is very complex or unpredictable and when movement is slow, when you actually have time to process this information, then a feedback-based centralized controller will work best. On the other hand, if the environment is very simple, so when animals are flying in air or swimming through water, when it's relatively predictable between each stride, or when information is very noisy or very, very fast, we don't actually have time to process that information, then a distributed system that is feed-forward based will work way better. 
So where are cockroaches here? So cockroaches are move very, very fast, but on terrestrial, terrestrial, often uneven, very rough terrain. Um, and this is kind of the question that I was um, asking myself when I started my postdoc, and I will, um, I will simply, or I will divide it to three related questions. So how cockroaches produce the appropriate motor pattern for locomotion? Uh, to what extent proprioceptive, which is the feedback uh, about our location and speed in space, so feedback about our body positions, which, to which extent that type of information is needed for, for cockroaches to run as fast as they do, and how a control strategy of a single organism is related to the environment and speed that, or for that specific instant. To answer these questions, uh, we look both on the nervous system, so this is um, an example of general nervous system of an insect and I will go back to the nervous system so maybe I will go through it very quickly for the non-biologists. So we have the brain uh, and then we have a thoracic ganglia so basically comparable to uh, our nerve cord which is the spinal cord which is controlling the legs and the wings and all the other appendages and then we have abdominal ganglia each one is controlling um, one segment of the abdomen. So to answer how much, what is the controller, we need to look both on the behavior and also seeing what is the controller, what the controller can produce. So how do cockroaches run? Cockroaches and also all most other insects, they walk and run in a double tripod gate, which was proven to be a very stable gate. Actually, we can extend it over from insects. So if you look at any type of creature with any number of legs will always have some sort of movement between right and left side of the body. So the center of mass will always move <coughs> from right to left. This is for bipedal movement when I walk, for um, when you have four or six or eight legs, this all uh, often this rule remains. And the way to do it with six legs is you always have <coughs> so two legs in one side and one leg in the other side. So this is why it's called a tripod are on the ground and then this switches to the other side. So this type of movement is a stable gate and often used by cockroaches. Um, this gate seemed unchanged also when there's perturbations or obstacles in the environment. And these are two examples, one of cockroaches walking on these blocks that are actually the size of the cockroach body. This is the muscle activation on flat terrain, on a rough terrain, and it's almost identical. Uh, <coughs> we tested it a little bit further with specific magnetic perturbation to one of the legs, and we see that even after this perturbation that completely jerked the, le jerked the leg up, the movement haven't changed almost at all. So cockroaches really have this very fast dynamic stability that allow them to overcome this or ignore this in a lot of cases. And on the other side, on the other hand, if we look at the nervous system, so again, here's the nervous system, the brain, and the thoracic ganglia is controlling the legs. I will often uh, use this terminology R2, R3, R2, R1, R2, R3 to uh, describe the legs on the right side of the body and L1, L2 and L3 describing the legs on the left side of the body. So if you just take, take the nervous system outside of the animal, put it in a petri dish and see what are the motor patterns, what are the motor neurons doing when there's no sensor information, there's no brain. And what do they do? They can actually do this. So if you look at one leg, if you look at a uh, motor neuron that activates a depressor muscle, a muscle that moves the leg down, and motor neuron activating elevator muscle that pull the leg up, we see these beautiful alternations of this antagonistic activity that relates to the stance and a swing part of each step. And this could be generated with no sensory feedback. If we record from different legs, we also see this tripod pattern of um, if you look at the right side of the body, the middle and the hind leg, and the left side of the body, we see these alternations that are happening in a dish with no sensor information. So <clears throat> the basic locomotion pattern is pre-programmed. It could be generated by central pattern generating networks at the thoracic ganglia, and they don't actually need sensory feedback to be created. Um, but how does sensor information adjust this basic pattern? And in order to do that, um, this was what I was trying to do in my postdoc. I was trying to add more and more sensory modalities to this um, nervous system to see how a single sensory information adjusted, integrated, and adjusted the default pattern we recorded. So I was adding sensory modalities. The other way around, I was taking the 
the intact behavior animal that we saw the kinematics before and removing some of the sensory modalities trying to approach the isolated nervous system uh, so I'll just give two examples here so adding sensory modalities I left one leg intact and let it step and here we see the 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 um, the pattern the the isolated pattern of the nervous system so we only have front leg here and here I record from the middle and the hind ganglia and we see this some sort of alternating pattern but whenever we have a step in the front leg this pattern become stronger and more tightly coupled this is an example of three steps and if you look at the phase differences between the middle and the right the middle and the hind leg after every step we see that these phases become much tighter close to um, <clears throat> to 0 0.5, which would be the phase of an uh, animal walking in a tripod gait. So information from a stepping leg reinforces and entrain and strengthen the centrally generated pattern. Um, so on the other way around, we could actually take the animal and remove sensory modalities. One of the simplest things to do is to apply this toxin, pimotrazine, that what it does is actually reduces the tension in chordotonal organs. Chordotonal organs are the ones that are measuring how a joint is um, extended. And if we, if we treated an animal with pimotrazic, basically the, all the chordotonal organs, all the stretch organs become kind of loose. And so this is recording from the sensory uh, neuron of the chordotonal organ in control animal after each leg flex, flexion. And here, uh, treated animals, this sensor information is no longer available to the animal. And if you look at the stepping patterns, we see indeed that the stepping pattern changes. If this is a stepping pattern of a normal healthy cockroach, this is the one of a treated cockroach, we see that the legs are kind of all over the shop. But even though the spatial trajectories is completely changed, there was no effect on the temporal leg coordination. Suggested the temporal leg coordination could be um, could be extracted without information about the positions of the legs. So, so yeah, so basically sensory information is important. It has a strong influence on the pattern, but when it's removed, we could also see almost normal behavior. And this brought me to the, to the understanding that maybe this is a little naive, my approach. It could be the different sensory modalities Compensate. So we have redundancy. This is a very common principle in biology. We have redundancy and different type of proprioceptive information are basically uh, parallelizing each other. And if you remove one, animals can still behave almost normally uh, by compensation of the other modalities. In any case, in ongoing work, we try to get a little bit more deeper into the system to use more, um, more exact perturbations, more to record activity in different levels. So here we have a stimulus, a very accurate stimulus on one joint, and then we can record the neural activity. So the general uh, pattern, the default pattern is almost completely unaffected, but we do see a change in the muscle activity and the kinematics, which is that it could be some sort of a response to the sensory information that didn't go through the central nervous system at all. And we also do more accurate circuit mappings to see uh, sensory projections and how they interact with the motor neurons. So, yeah, so for legs, for walking, tripod gait is pretty good. Animals just basically, the legs need to be down and propel the animal forward. You could have, think about a lot of solutions to do that. Maybe sensory information there is... It is important, but it's not so essential in a lot of cases. But what about antennal movement? So... The antennae are kind of interesting organs. Insects get almost, perceive almost all the sensory information from the antenna. They smell what the antenna, they sense vibration, temperature, uh, they touch with the antenna. And so the way the antenna are moving or the way the antenna are lo lo uh, localized in time is very important for the animal to how to read the world. Is there an optimal solution to scan the world? So we know that we already found out there's an optimal solution to how to move the legs, to walk. But what about sensing? Is there an optimal solution for sensing? What is the control strategy for sensing, for moving the antenna? So the, the way the antenna moved really determined what the animal would be able to see. Um, how much this movement is actually related to what the animal is seeing or smelling at the moment? So this is something that we actually don't know at all. Is antenna movement a process of feedback or feed-forward type of process? So maybe I will... Um, 
yeah, I'll maybe explain in general what I mean by um, feed forward and feedback in the case of sensing uh, and active sensing. So sensing could be passive or it could be active. Um, if sensing is passive, then the, the stimulus, which is here, the apple, the smell of the stimulus doesn't affect at all. It's represented in the brain. This is the neural representation of the stimulus. And it's not affecting at all the movement of these sensory organs. Um, and we also have active sensing, so, so here passive, so this is um, sensory systems that don't actively move. They could be moved by the environment, but they're not actively moving. And here we have an example for active movement, which could be in open loop situation. So the smell of the apple, it is not actually affecting the way that the antenna will move later on. Um, the animal also have, so it has two types of information. It had some sort of proprioceptive information, what I spoke before, so the antenna knows where it is located it's in space. And that information could be available for the animal in all these schemes. But the ex-afferent external stimulation, the smell of the apple, uh, only in a closed loop form will affect the way of the motion. So basically we have three, uh, three, parameter, three uh, variables, the sensory environment, the neural representation of the sensory environment and uh, the, the motion. And what we're trying to see is basically parameterize this system from what we have. So the sensory stimulus is affected by, by the motion or by the location of the sensory organs and by the state of the environment. In our case, we're studying, we're looking at smelling, so the other environment. The neural representation, of course, depends on the state of the brain and also on the sensory information that the brain perceived. And the motor decision will be either independent from the sensory stimulation or from the neural representation of the sensory f information or dependent on it. So what I'm trying to see is in order to understand how the antenna are moving or whether this is or whether animals smell in a closed or open loop way, we're basically trying to do experiments to parameterize these variables. And we ask what are the features and the time scales of sensory stimuli that affect the movement in a closed loop form. So we kind of know that we know that the antenna are active and we also know that in some, in some time scales and some magnitudes of course that the movement will be related to the stimulus but we don't actually know what are the time scale and what are the features that will affect motion. What are the features that are closed in a closed loop form. Um, so, yes, yeah, so what we need to do in order to understand sensing and antenna movement, we need to understand the sensory in environment, uh, insect encounters, and sometimes it's very, um, uh, it's very um, chaotic or turbulent. Sometimes we have gradients, depends on if animals are flying through air or walking on the ground. So we need to be able to characterize the sensory environment and look at the behavior, what the animal is doing in that specific sensory environment. And in principle, if we look at this, if we know everything about the sensory environment and we know everything about the behavior, we could actually create these algorithms that animals do to convert the sensory environment into decisions. Um, but as a neuroscientist, I'm actually wanting to understand the mechanism underlying it. And for that, we also want to see what is the, how is the sensory environment represented in the brain and how these mo motion or movement decisions are created. Um, so yeah, the questions maybe I will, uh, this is mainly a project by my PhD student, Antoine Hoffman, and we're trying to understand what is the relations between active antennal sampling um, and the stimuli uh, for olfaction. Um, we want to know how stimuli are perceived and integrated and influence future behavior, and how do these decisions are depending on the environmental context, on the complexity of the environment, of the experience on the animal, and its motivation. So for the sensory environment, we started with building a very simple wind tunnel that could allow us to have a laminar flow of odor. Um, we have a precise odor stimulation uh, that was developed in the lab by uh, Georg Reiser that could allow us to, to construct temporarily very accurate, very precise uh, stimulus. And we have camera systems that were set by Lupio to actually track the antenna and see what the animal is doing. Um, so here's an example for concentrations of odorants that are given that we can measure them and we could also move the other stimulator device around so to see how the animal is tracking uh, a moving plume. 
But as I said, also, it's not enough. Oh, this is not, oh, you cannot see. Can you see the plume here? It's very, very uh, overexposed. But anyway, so there is a plume here. And if you see why the cockroach moving its antenna, it's actually changing the properties of the plume. So it's not enough to actually quantify the other <coughs> concentrations in the tunnel before we do the experiments, but it's important to do it during an experiment because the interaction of the animal with the environment actually changes the environment. Okay, so how, how behavior, how, what do the cockroaches do? So here we have an example of a stimulus, um, of an odor stimulus of a colony odor that is presented to the animal. And these are the stimulations. And after each stimulus, we see that it takes some time, but then animals starting to walk after both of these stimuli. And also the both antennae are getting close together. So here we see these antennas sweeping of uh, the right and the left antenna. And during every stimulus, we see that the animal is projecting its antenna forward. Um, oh yeah, we have a video here. We could look at the animal. This is the stimulus, and then you saw that the antenna brought forward, which is not a naturalistic behavior uh, when the stimulus are not presented. And this seems to be actually odor specific. So we tested here three different odorants. One is butanol, kind of this, um, it's the smell like it's some sort of sugars when they are, um, so it's the smell of fermentations of sugar in agriculture crops. It's really smelling disgusting. Uh, linalool, which has some sort of floral odor and a colony odor that the cockroaches like very much. Um, and we see that this antennal projection response is very specific to the colony odor. Uh, in, in terms of walking, these three different odorants, they all uh, increase the propensity of the animal to walk forward in different delays, different patterns, um, but they all increased walking behavior towards the odor. Um, if we look at the antennal movement, we see also a change in the antennal movement. So we see here the antenna. And what we see is the increase in, uh, so this is the, the wavelet transformation. So we see here the different frequencies. And during the other stimulation, we see increase mainly in the faster frequencies, uh, perhaps also in the smaller, but mainly we see an increase in higher frequencies. We could actually divide this space to two, um, to what we call sweeping, which is basically moving the antenna left and right or up and down to, uh, yeah. Uh, no, here it was. It's on a slippery on on a slippery surface, so it's kind of just slides on. Um, and so the the problem with treadmills is that they often produce a lot of air from. So to to support the, you often have like air su suspended ball, which creates a lot of turbulence in the other environment. So this is why we're using just um, basically a surface that the animal is sliding over. Um, <clears throat> so antenna movement could be divided perhaps, and this is an idea we have maybe to two components, the sweeping, which is basically searching uh, the order in space, and flicking, which is kind of this high frequency movement that perhaps is important for order detection or something else. Um, so if you look at the, the activity and the different frequencies bands in response to different odorants, we see general increase in this flicking behavior for all odorants, but mainly after the stimulus is off, which means animal may be perhaps trying to perceive it better after odor elimination. Um, so we still don't know what are the roles of the sweeps, what are the role of the flickers, and for odorant detection or, yeah, but this is something that is still an open question and we're trying to understand that. Uh, in addition, we're also looking whether the animal will follow the plume if we move the plume away, and we do see that it does. Um, so if you look at the left antenna, the other is moving towards in this direction, the left antenna follows, the right antenna follows a little bit as well. And this behavior is not seen if we just have a, um, a plume of air. So this is specific actually to follow the odorant stimulations. Um, okay, so then we know we give different type of sensory stimulations, we look at the behavior, and really to understand how this is coupled, we need to understand how the brain sees these stimulations. And this is the brain of a cockroach um, and the, the, the first ganglion on the cockroach chain. 
an image that was done here in the uh, bioimaging center by Marco Paoli. Um, okay, so let's look at the representation of odors in the brain. So the first station that odor is processed is on the antenna. The antenna have these type of hairs, this type of sensilla, and we could actually record the activity within individual sensilla and see how the odorant was perceived. So in these sensillas we have the olfactory receptor neurons, in this example we have two neurons in one sensilla, and we can have our recording sharp electrode uh, going inside the sensilla base to record the activity. This is how it looks under the microscope, so you barely see something, but there is here a sensilla, and these are recording electrodes, and these are action potentials that are generated by the recorded neurons by the odor stimulation. So these are the, the stimuli, and these are the responses. Um, and what we, oh, yeah, okay, and then if we look at the frequency over time for each of these stimulations, we see that the frequency goes down with time. Basically, these sensory structures getting adapted to the stimulus over time. And this brought us the idea that perhaps moving the antenna, flicking the antenna in and out of the plume could actually help the animal to overcome this adaptation because you don't have a continuous stimulus anymore but an intermittent. And we're trying to compare the responses to continuous stimulation and intermittent stimulations and stimulations that are created by looking at the antennal movement. So we take the antennal movement basically and record them and then play them as the, um, as the olfactory stimulation that would have happened if the animal would move naturally. Uh, then this information from the olfactory sensory neuron in going to the brain, and the first station in the brain is the antenna lobe where odorants are being processed. Uh, and here I will show uh, work of three different people. So Marco Paoli that we saw the imaging before, Inga Petelski, which is a PhD student in the lab, and Sarah Streicher. Um, and they are all trying to understand how odors are encoded in the brain. Oh, the pictures are so not good. But anyway, I don't know if you imagine. So these are the cell bodies in the antennal lobe of the animal, the projection neurons that are perceive information. They get the dendrites from the olfactory sensory neurons and then send them later on to higher brain centers. And each of them is innervated by a glomerulus that you cannot see it, but basically it's like one circular structure uh, that contains, um, that responds to receptors of one type on the antenna. Uh, here is a response by calcium imaging. So here basically we record the activity in the, this region, in the antenna lobe, an increase in calcium often indicate an increase in neural activity. And the yellow bits corresponds to areas, regions that could be either one glomeruli or a few glomeruli, regions of higher activation following the stimulus. Um, so calcium imaging is a very nice technique. It allows us to look at the entire antenna lobe at once to see the response. But if you really want to understand the temporal uh, structure of the response, we need to look at one projection neuron. And this is intracellular recording from one of these projection neurons. Here we could see the glomeruli structure responding to one specific odorant. And in this case, the response was actually inhibition in activity. Um, so here we have our recordings, experiments and analysis done by Marco. Uh, and we see the entire antenna lobe responding to mineral oil. So very, very weak response and to different odorants. An interesting question is also how do odorants that are perceived on different locations of the antenna are perceived in the brain? So we know that the cockroach has these huge long antennae. They're actually bigger than the body size. Um, and this gives us a very wide working range to detect odorants. But do they actually know exactly where on the antenna the odorants are detected? And for that, uh, we give stimulations at different locations and then seeing the difference in responses. So we see uh, strongest responses to very proximal stimulation, weakest responses to distal stimulation, which suggests perhaps the animal know where uh, on the antenna the stimulus was. Um, okay, I will go uh, one more stage towards understanding this loop between the sensory stimulation, the neural representation, and the motor output. And now we're looking at the motor output. So we record the motor output from the antenna. So for the motor neurons that are innervating the antenna movement, and these are the antennal kinematics, or from um, descending neurons that are basically transmitting this information down to the legs. And here is an example of recording 
uh, from two sites along the nerve cord of the animal where descending neurons are transmitting this information downwards towards uh, steps. Um, so these examples of recording, the extracellular recording, so we have um, basically wires that are touching the entire uh, connectives of the nerve cords. There are thousands of axons passing here. And so with these recordings, in principle, we cannot distinguish uh, single cells as in the recording I showed before. But one technique that we could use is that if we have uh, two pairs of electrodes, we could actually detect spikes in one of the electrodes and then calculate, then plot what is the activity in the other electrode beside it. And then one axon that has one thickness will have one transmission speed along the axon. And then if we look at the activity at the second electrode aligned to the first, we could actually discriminate individual units uh, in an extracellular recording. So we give an order stimulation, we record the activity from the ipsilateral side of the stimulated antenna from the contralateral side and we could start asking questions how this sensory stimulation affected movement decision that are transmitted down to the legs in the de descending neurons. We can also answer perhaps our question is whether the animal knows where the stimulus was on the antenna because we can give stimulus at different location and then we rec record the activity to go down to the legs and interestingly we see that perhaps it knows. So here, for example, for a stimulus of a group order, we see that um, stimulation of the distal side resulted in uh, a bigger difference between activity of the right and the left side of the body. So this is responses. So we're stimulating the right antenna, we're recording responses on the left side and the right side, and if we take the difference between these, this could be some sort of proxy to intentional turning. And we see basically the stu distal stimulus, intentional turning is higher towards that stimulation. Uh, so this is all work in progress. Oh, I'm already, I spoke really fast. Okay, this is all a work in progress, but in what we so far saw is that antenna movement responds to changes in the olfactory environment. Um, so we saw wide antenna sweeping often change to fast localized flicking after order detection and after order elimination also. Um, Perhaps this is a special temporal resolution that we have here, that the animal would scan the environment until it detects an odor, and then it will stay on that location and do higher flickering activity to perceive that odor better. Um, so we see that movement decisions are linked to the spatial structure of the olfactory cues. And we are wanting to know which of the olfactory features, which of the time scales are relevant for modulating movement. We want to define regions of open and closed loop perception in olfaction. And the last question that we're interested in is related to the cluster is how relation between movement and sensing happening in a group of insects when the sensory, uh, the sensory agent is not necessarily one animal, but it could be a group of communicating animals. Uh, and this is a work by Inga Petelsky and Jackie McCl McCollum. <laughs> Uh, and here we see uh, tracking by Vivek software of uh, cockroaches in an arena. This arena has two shelters that they like to hide in. One of them contains a food order, the other one doesn't. And we see that when individuals are tested alone, they all go to the food order shelter. When they're tested in the group, this actually being inverted and they, in, on average, prefer the other unscented shelter. Uh, we can m mimic the group by just introducing a group order and here we have just one individual tested, but we included also a group order, and the order of the group itself was enough to create this inversion of less interest in the vanillin shelter and more aggregation in the control shelter. So what, what, it, what actually happened here, why this inversion is happening, is the group not perceiving the food order, or perhaps uh, the interaction between the individual changes when there's food, maybe when there's food they're less attracted to other individuals, and to know what is influencing what, whether the group influencing the perception of the order or whether the perception order influences their grouping behavior, we look into the brain. Um, so we go back to the antenna lobe of the cockroach where orders are first perceived and processed, and this is how a response to Van Lien to the food order looks in the antenna lobe of an individual cockroach. And if we do the same experiment, but not have only vanillin, but also addition of group order, we see a change, complete change of pattern of activation in the antenna lobe. 
Um, and we could actually repeat this with increasing concentration of group odor. So when we have this as the response to the vanillin, the food odor response, when we add a little bit of feces extract to mimic group, we see that this response is still quite similar. But when we add more feces extract, this response changed to be very similar to the response to the only group odor. Um, so perhaps animals in the group, the group is masking the ability to smell the odor somehow. We still don't really understand why. We don't know whether this is a mechanism to avoid competition, but this is something we're interested in. Uh, and we would like to understand this in bigger groups and in animals that are specialized in group navigation, uh, like the swarm forming locusts. And I will finish with a video that we just took from Sardinia when we were trying to track and follow locust groups. Um, the work was not very successful because, as you could see, the animals are tiny and very, very cryptic. It's very hard to see them, uh, even with this very high-resolution camera. Uh, but we still got to see how locusts could aggregate and create these huge plagues. Um, okay, so I would like to thank everybody. Thanks my collaborator, Professor Philip Holmes uh, from Princeton University and Professor Giovanni Galizia from here. Dr. Marco Paoli that did all the beautiful imaging, and Hiroshi Nishino from University of Hokkaido in Japan, and my current lab members that did all the work. Uh, and Angela for taking this beautiful video and making our field trip happen, and thank you everybody. Yeah. Uh, with the calcium imaging response to the vanilla and plus group odor, um, could you look at mixtures of just non-social odors, and is that a different thing, or do you still get that kind of inhibition? So it's a very important question. Uh, we haven't looked at it in cockroaches. This was, it, it is being studied uh, in Yena, in flies, and the responses to mixture is very diff often very different from the response of the individual components. We don't know much about um, mixture perception in cockroaches, so we really only started this because of the experimental observation that they avoid the vanillin shelter in a group. Uh, but yeah, it is defi there's definitely interactions. There's lo the, we know that there are local interons that are inhibiting uh, each other. So yeah, the response to a mixture is definitely different from the two responses of the individual orders. Can you tell me the distribution of the receptors on the antennae and how many articles they have? Uh... Okay, so I can't. <laughs> Uh, I know that, so receptors, for, uh, so specific receptors are distributed all over the antenna. They're not organized by type. Um, they are mostly, ag most, the higher density area is actually the middle of the antenna. And this is all I know from, we did uh, uh, antenna electrograms to a few different odorants, and then we saw stronger responses on the middle part, when the middle part of the antenna was stimuli. I think that the proximal part and the middle part has higher density in general, um, but yeah, I, don't, I, I cannot tell you for each specific receptor. Mm -hmm. So for the cockroaches, uh, at the beginning of your talk, you, as far as I understood, you said that this kind of uh, how they move, how they coordinate their legs is nearly independent of the mm -hmm. ground. Mm -hmm. So what, what does that mean? Is, is like the movement of the legs done in a way that they, it's, it's like error tolerant, like, like if it hits some, something that is uh, in their way, that they, how do they adjust to that? They just keep on their... Yes, uh, so, yeah, so, so the actual body structure allows them to deal with a lot of this computation without sensory feedback. So you will just, the leg will bounce back, mm -hmm. and because the body is so stable and the speed it's running, the, the body itself would not lose uh, its center of mass. Yes. Exactly, so the leg will bounce back and it will continue. Of course, if the perturbation would be strong enough, and, and we were collaborating with a group of Robert, uh, Robert Full in Berkeley, and they were trying to see how much they can perturb the cockroach to affect its behavior, and they ended up using a cannon that completely shooted the, the cockroach out of track, and even with that, it recovered pretty quickly, but of course, that perturbation completely took everything off. But small to moderate perturbations could be dealt in the level of basically the biomechanics without any brain uh, taking part. Yeah. But of course, when cockroach will walk slowly or on the ceiling, that will, that will be different. So it really depends on the actual circumstances of the actual movement. So I was actually wondering about the um, 
antenna location and that's effect on neural response. Do you think that that's something that can be used to detect like gradients and differences in concentration or does that require a movement of the antenna? That's a very good question. I don't know. I'm, we're testing this. Um, I feel, and this is we try to do actually, I try to work with Jacob here to do a model to see perhaps you could detect gradients without, uh, without moving the antenna. So there's, there, there are more properties to these receptors. So for example, they will respond very fast to high concentration. So they respond strong and fast to high concentration. They respond weak and slow to low concentration. And I thought that maybe putting these two together, animal could compute gradients without moving the antenna. So far with the model we used, it could not. It actually needs some sort of either temporal comparison or spatial comparison. Uh, so either moving in time in one position or in space. Um, but I, I don't have the answer to that yet. So I still think that there may be a way. So, so what, what, if I look at the cockroaches and I present an order stimuli, they first move the antenna and then they walk and then they approach or decide on direction. Um, so I think that the antenna movement definitely assisting to assess the concentration gradient. Whether they can do it without it, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Do you think that odor perception, but maybe also locomotion, has similar mechanisms uh, across the animal kingdom? I mean, if you go from from your insects to vertebrates or to something in between? Yes. So I believe yes. I find a lot of homologies with the way we sniff and the animal, the uh, cockroach is moving the antenna, or animals that cannot move the antenna the way they move the body to basically move their sensory organs. Um, so I think yes. Of course, the olfactory system is designed a little bit different, but a lot of the underlying principles are conserved. And I think that the general principles would be. Um, but it would be very, very cool to work with vertebrate neuroscientists and try to find the parallels.